With much joy, we welcome Dr. Richard Lenski back to Carolina and look forward to his keynote address this morning. Dr. Lenski. Thank you, Chancellor Folt and Dean Matson and Madeline for that warm introduction, and it's just so exciting to be back here. So let me begin by congratulating all of you who are receiving your PhDs today. Each of you climbed a mountain that no one before you had ever climbed. That's what made it a doctorate, original research leading to new knowledge. My remarks today are about constancy versus change and about luck versus skill. These turn out to be core themes in the research that I do, and they also have a lot to do with life, including the decisions we all make in our professional careers. Speaking of constancy, some things hardly change. I got my PhD here in 1982, the Carolina Men's Basketball Championship, Tar Heels won, Dean Smith, the building's named after him, and what happened this year? Same thing. Of course, there have also been a lot of changes since I was a student. Music, for example. When we'd go out to the bar and listen to music, we had these awesome communal listening devices called jukeboxes. You, di you, didn't, you didn't even need headphones to hear the music. One of the awesome uh, groups of the day that, that we heard was Cool in the Gang. They had a great song called Celebration. And if you're having a party tonight, I recommend you put that song on your playlist. Uh, it's a great song. But crossover country music was also very big. And one of the stars in that genre was uh, Kenny Rogers, who had a hit song called The Gambler, about advice from an old poker player. And you've all probably heard it. It goes like this, so I think we'll get a... You got to know when the hole. All right, just a snippet. Oh, thank you. Great. Thanks. She does everything. Perfect. <laughs> of course, the song is about life, using poker as a metaphor. Just as in our careers and lives, poker requires making decisions in the face of uncertainty. I had a lot of very good luck when I was at Carolina. One of the parties I went to, I happened to meet Madeline, a different one from the one who introduced me, my wife over there. Uh, she was a graduate student in the School of Public Health, so that was an example of the terrific luck I had here. But I also faced some difficulties, and while I managed to get through them, they led me to change the direction of my research. I came to Carolina to study ecology, which focuses on the interactions of species in their roles in nature. And I got interested in biology when I took a non-majors course at Oberlin College and saw the grand sweep of ideas and new discoveries from molecular biology to vertebrate evolution. As I contemplated graduate school, I focused on ecology because it was filled with interesting and unanswered questions that at least to my naive self back then seemed like they wouldn't be too hard to study. Many ecologists are superb naturalists including Nelson Harston, the late Nelson Harston, who was my PhD advisor here, studied salamanders and knew their biology inside and out. Or Charles Darwin, who was fond of beetles. On a collecting trip in his young adulthood, he already had two beetles that he wanted to keep, one in each hand, when he came on a third that he also wanted to keep. He was so in love with beetles that he took one of them from his hand and popped it in his mouth so that he could grab a third beetle. Well, the one he popped in his mouth was something called a bombardier beetle that squirts out two chemicals from its back end and combines them in an explosive exothermic reaction. And needless to say, Darwin lost all three of those beetles. As a kid, I loved being outdoors, hiking and playing sports, but I wasn't a naturalist. I didn't know very much about any particular group of animals or plants. And at least partly, this lack of understanding and familiarity with organisms in the wild made my first efforts at doing ecological research failures. And I'm going to give one example because it's kind of funny, at least with hindsight. I tried to do an experiment using praying mantises. I reared batches of them in the lab from egg cases and then released them on small plots out at Mason Farm, here on part of the Carolina campus. And I had two different treatments. 
I had painstakingly cleared the vegetation around each plot by hand so that the manises would stay put in their respective treatments. Well, maybe a week later, the next time I went out to see how my experiment was going, there were no more mantises. I couldn't find a single one. I think maybe when I'd been out there, some birds were watching me saying, what's this crazy guy doing? And then went down and gobbled them all up. I really have no idea what happened, but that experiment was a total bust. But with hindsight, I was lucky that project failed right away. The treatment effect I was looking for would probably not have given a significant outcome given the scale of the experiment, even if the manises had stayed put. So failures can sometimes be valuable by keeping us from wasting time and by forcing us to change direction. Maybe some of you who are getting your degrees today had failed projects as well before you found your bearings. It's a normal part of science and scholarship, though it's upsetting when it happens. I then had another project that failed, but at least the second failure led me to the study system that became my dissertation, which was about the effects of forest clear cutting in the mountains of Western North Carolina and competition among a certain group of insects called ground beetles. I love being outdoors in the mountains of Western North Carolina. Although the frequent rainstorms often flooded the pitfall traps that I used to catch the beetles, drenching both the beetles and me. But this project at last was a successful one. I got my dissertation and got a few nice papers out of it. But I also had doubts that this line of research was a good fit for my own interests and skills. Maybe some of you are at similar points in your career. I'm sure some of you have found the work that you want to do for the rest of your lives. And if so, more power to you. That's terrific. But others of you might be pondering or planning a change, using your wonderful new degree and your experience, but setting off in a new direction. Maybe not right away, but perhaps keeping an eye out for future opportunities that better match your own skills and interests. In my case, an exciting opportunity came from a graduate reading group in ecology, where we read a paper about the coevolution of bacteria and viruses that infect bacteria. Even though I had no experience in microbiology, I wrote the head of that lab with an idea for a project related to the paper, and again, lucky for me, he invited me for an interview and I was offered a postdoctoral position. Before I started that new position, I was worried about working in a new area where once again, I had no experience. Well, I soon discovered that I enjoyed the work. I wasn't good at it right away, but I liked the rhythm of a microbiology laboratory. Unlike praying mantises, the bacteria stayed in the flasks where you put them. There weren't rainstorms drowning the experiments in the microbiology lab. And with microbes, sometimes you could get meaningful results of experiments within a single day. But down the road, there were more hurdles, as there always are. In my first year of looking for a faculty position, I applied for dozens and dozens of jobs. I got one interview and no offers. Meanwhile, the grant that funded the research that I was working on wasn't renewed, and I had a growing family to support. I even thought about leaving science, and if Lady Luck hadn't come through for me yet again, I might have. That grant was renewed on the second try, and in my second year on the job market, I got two offers. So I headed out to Irvine, California, where I started a project that Madeline mentioned in her introduction that continues to this day now at Michigan State University. The project is an evolution experiment. And this, the experiment was set up to address the same themes as my talk today. Luck or randomness and skill, constancy and change, but addressing it in a scientific context rather than a personal one. In evolution, genetic mutations are random events, while the process that Darwin discovered, adaptation by natural selection, sometimes called survival of the fittest, it multiplies the best competitors across the generations. And I wanted to see how luck and skill, that is the tension between random mutation and natural selection, would play out if we could watch evolution over and over and over. So I set up 12 populations of E. coli bacteria, all started from the same genetic stock, and I put them in identical flasks, identical temperatures, identical food, and so on. And I wanted to know, would they all change and adapt in the same way 
showing the power of natural selection to shape life, or would each population evolve along a different path, highlighting the importance of luck or random mutation in the evolutionary outcome? One thing that makes bacteria great for this experiment is that we can freeze samples and then later revive them as actually living cells. So in essence, our freezers have become time travel machines for the bacteria, allowing us to directly compare and even compete organisms that lived at different times in the past. Now, you've all heard about our close relatives, our human close relatives, the Neanderthals, who went extinct about 40,000 years ago. Some of you might know that their DNA has been discovered, recovered from fossils, allowing their genomes to be analyzed. It's even been discovered that almost all of us have stretches of Neanderthal DNA in our own genomes. But despite these amazing advances, we don't really know what the Neanderthals were like and how similar they would be to us if they were raised in our world. How would they play chess or music or basketball? What topics would they choose for their dissertations? What would they talk about if they were standing at this podium? Well, we don't know the answers to those questions, but back to the experiment with bacteria. We've seen many parallel changes in the 12 replicate populations, showing that natural selection can sometimes make evolution quite predictable, despite the randomness of mutations. But we've also seen differences emerge, including in one lineage out of the 12, a surprising new ability to grow on a resource that E. coli bacteria cannot normally use. And along the way, new technologies that didn't exist when I started this experiment have come forward, allowing us to sequence the genomes of hundreds of bacteria from this experiment from different generations and different populations, letting us examine and test the repeatability of evolution down to the level of the DNA itself. I sometimes call this the experiment that keeps on giving. I originally intended the experiment to go for at least 2,000 generations, which would take about a year. Well, today it's been running for almost 30 years, and we just passed, a week or two ago, 67,000 generations. The experiment keeps on giving because the bacteria keep evolving in interesting and often unexpected ways, and because students, like those of you in the audience, bring new questions and ideas to the project. My hope is that it will continue long after I'm gone. Well, the experiment gets a lot of nice press and compliments these days, but there have been some obstacles along the way. When the first paper about this experiment was submitted, one reviewer was very negative and even hostile. The reviewer wrote, and I quote, I feel like a professor giving a poor grade to a good student. Ouch. <laughs> uh, without any suggestions for how to improve it. In fact, the reviewer even wrote, quote, this paper has merit and no errors, but I do not like it. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to fold. I liked the cards in this hand. So I wrote a rebuttal, and the paper was published. And in fact, it went on to receive the journal's best paper award for that year. A second obstacle was one of my own making. I came across another experimental system that I found fascinating and still do. Artificial life in the form of computer programs that can replicate, mutate, and evolve to solve complex problems. At the time, I thought maybe this long-term experiment with bacteria had sort of run out of new things and it had run its course. Well, unlike in poker, when you face challenges about what to do in your careers in science and scholarship, you can ask other people for advice. And in this case, it's a great thing that I did because I was able to have my cake and eat it too. Everybody said, you've got to keep the experiment going. It's too valuable. And so my lab has kept this experiment going, and it has continued to be a scientific gold mine. Now, along the way, some creationists have criticized our work. Some have openly said they don't believe our results, while others believe us but say, in effect, see, there's still only bacteria as though any scientist would expect to see worms or monkeys or whatever emerge from an experiment like this. There can be many reasons for misunderstandings between scientists and the public. Problems of education, 
politics, and communication. The third problem, communication, is one that we can strive to overcome by explaining our work not only to our close disciplinary colleagues, but also to the general public. And a couple of years ago, I had a wonderful opportunity to communicate science to a broad public audience. I was asked by the producer of the television show Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman to do a segment about our research on bacteria for that show. One of the scenes had me playing poker with a few of my students. It was intended to show how the effects of a random event, a particular card in a game of poker, depends on the context in which it occurs. The same thing is true in evolution. A particular mutation that might be beneficial in one species in one environment might be detrimental or even lethal in a different species or a different environment. Let's have a look at that clip, if we could, please. When there is a queen and a king of hearts on the table and you have the ten and ace of hearts in your hand, you are set up to potentially make a royal flush, the most powerful hand in poker. All you need is for the final card to be a jack of hearts. So just like in that make-believe game of poker, in my real life, I've been so lucky. I was born to parents who nurtured me. I was born in a nation dedicated to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And like those of you who are receiving your degrees today, I was fortunate to get a superb education here at Carolina. The French microbiologist Louis Pasteur, who in the 1800s disproved spontaneous generation, invented what we call pasteurization, and developed the first rabies vaccine, said, chance favors the prepared mind. Thanks to your Carolina education and the hard work that brought you today to where we are today, you have a prepared mind. You will encounter many uncertainties, probably some obstacles, and hopefully some terrific opportunities as the cards of life are dealt to you. Play them well, know when to hold them, know when to fold them, and sometimes you won't really know what to do so you'll just have to give it your best shot. Thank you and congratulations again to all of you receiving your doctorate degrees today.